Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to today's session. We're really, really glad to be kicking off a new three-part series, Planning for CRM Success. I'm Jason Gumbert from msdynamicsworld.com, and we're joined today by a longtime friend of the site, Rick McCutcheon. Many of you probably already know Rick. He's a longtime champion of dynamic CRM and best practices in Salesforce automation, sales strategy. He's also a Microsoft MVP and a returning speaker for us. Uh, so again, we're really glad to have him back for this new series. As we get started, I just want to add that we invite you to add your feedback and ask questions during the event. You can use the Q&A Q&A block that you should see to the right of the slides anytime during the session and just enter your questions in. I know Rick will make some time at the end. So without further delay, I am going to turn things over to our presenter, Rick McCutcheon. Rick, are you there? I am, Jason. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, we're going to be doing a three-part session coming up, planning for CRM success. And, you know, getting prepared for this um, session over the last couple of months, we really started talking about, you know, the movement of CRM to the business ownership within many organizations away from IT. And a lot of my teachings, if you've been through any of my sessions in the past, are really based on that, you know, from a business perspective, how do you get more involved with the CRM project and how can you drive the CRM project? So um, I've run this workshop several times and we've had some very good responses and results. And basically, we're going to have that discussion about CRM ownership within the business and how the business can plan for CRM success. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, I'll run for around 50 minutes to an hour and then we'll have Q&A at the end. If you have any questions throughout the session, please just put them in the, uh, the question box, and if they're relevant, we'll, we'll jump on them right away. If they can wait uh, to the end, we'll answer your questions at the end of the session. So uh, on that note, let's get going. A little bit of my background, I've been in uh, CRM for quite a long time. I'm a dynamic CRM MVP, so most of my practice is around the Microsoft products and the Microsoft stack. I'm a CSP, which is a certified sales professional, so um, I've been involved with many strategic initiatives around Salesforce automation, and I've run sales organizations in the past. So today I'm going to give you a lot of examples around CRM. Most of my examples are Salesforce automation, but they absolutely, you know, can be used over on the customer service marketing automation side of things. I've had several CRM companies, so I understand really the development side of CRM and the user side. I also teach for MS Dynamics World. I'll be speaking at uh, CRM Evolution uh, next month in uh, New York. So if anybody's in New York, uh, please reach out to me and I'll, I'll see if I can get you uh, into that session. As well, I'll be uh, speaking at the CRM UG Summit in October, as well as uh, CRM Extreme in November. So there's lots of speaking coming up on the, uh, on the CRM front, so I'll do a lot of sessions. I do a lot of work with MS Dynamics World, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of my recordings on the site as well if you want to look at some of the other materials that I cover. Also do a lot of writing in this space, and uh, hopefully you follow my blog on fullcontactselling.com. So I'm excited about CRM. I've been in CRM for a long, long time, and uh, now we're seeing, starting to see what we call the ROI on CRM really come forward, and we're seeing CRM really being treated as a mainstream application. 20 years ago when I was starting out in CRM, I thought it was mainstream then, but now we're seeing it happen. And we're seeing, you know, people like Nucleus Research do studies. And in this study, they say for every dollar you spend on CRM, you should get a $5.60 return. And I say that's true if you do CRM right. And today we're really going to start to talk about how do we do CRM right? What are the things we need to do? How do we position who we need to be involved? The driver, um, and, and in this uh, quote here, is vendors at social marketing analytics and mobile to CRM, the offering goes up. Those are the reasons that CRM is being driven into the mainstream because I have a lot of people hitting on my company through social channels, talking to us, communicating with us, leaving posts about us. We need to know whether they're a customer prospect or part of our ecosystem as a partner. This is what's driving the CRM usage because we've got to consolidate this information so we can make sense out of this. And I'm going to you know, give you some more ROI um, 
uh, examples within CRM to help drive that for you. But you know what we're saying here, it's now mainstream. Gardner Group says uh, CRM is going to continue to grow, really, and they say kind of the same thing. It's going to grow because social media and surrounding technologies, web analytics, and e-commerce are also driving CRM. So these are exciting times. If you've sort of launched into CRM as a new career initiative or if you're a longtime CRM person, I think you're finally in the right space at the right time, and we're enjoying a lot of growth. And then Gardner also talks about the Internet of Things, where we start to bring the internet into um, applications, into machinery, into automobiles. So I think, again, that drives that whole customer relationship, partner relationship uh, ecosystem. So it's going to be a lot of fun over the next couple of years. Here's my favorite slide in the world, because I've been a CRM guy all my career, and I've had to deal with ERP-type people, enterprise resource planning people. And ERP really sort of owned the day, you know, the SAPs, the AX, the GPs. And now, according to Gardner, by 2017, CRM spending is going to outpace ERP spending. So I just love this slide, because finally, you know, we're at the top of the hill. We're the king of the castle, and it's only going to get better. And the reason, I, you know, I see this and the reason I think this is happening, is it's all about, you know, the uh, total cost of ownership. I think it's a lot less costly to develop something on a CRM platform. You can do it quicker. It's more nimble. And a lot of these CRM technologies like uh, Microsoft's built on their XRM platform is really giving us a new level of flexibility in CRM so we can build out things faster, smarter, you know, test things, whereas um, ERP technology seems to be more structured and more costly to develop on. So that's all good. In the Microsoft world, and, and I'll talk about, not a lot about the Microsoft world today, but, uh, you know, that's the ecosystem that I belong to, and it's a strong one, and it's really growing. So these are the numbers they gave us last uh, August at the uh, Dynamics launch. You know, there's 4 million users, 40,000 40, customers, 60% are going on Dynamics Cloud, or CRM Cloud. So uh, these numbers are going to grow. Uh, we're going to see some new numbers come out next month, and I think we're going to, you know, well be over the 6 million user mark. So I'm very, very excited about the growth of this product and about this, this Microsoft, what I call the ecosystem, growing up around this. So let me talk a little bit about the Microsoft offerings if you don't use Microsoft yet or if you just use CRM and you're looking for other things to surround it. So, you know, understanding the CRM opportunity from Dynamic CRM. You know, we've got a new version out there, uh, 2015. Uh, people are loving it. People are using it. It's more flexible than ever before. It's more powerful than ever before. So this is really the backbone of what, what, what we do around CRM. But we're seeing some really big gains in things like Dynamic CRM Mobile that can pretty much run on any platform out there for tablets or phones. When we talk about ROI, when we talk about um, giving functionality to the, our people in the field, most companies are moving towards some sort of mobile platform, and we're seeing, you know, hyper growth for CRM on these tablets. So, again, an exciting time for CRM. Microsoft also recently purchased uh, a company and rolled in a Dynamics Suite, uh, Dynamics Marketing. So this application is really for larger marketing organizations who need to do a lot of planning around sort of sort of multi-tactical uh, marketing programs, whether you, you may do broadcast, you may do billboard, you may do direct mail, you may do email marketing. This product is very powerful for that, uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk about some other products that, that do other components of marketing. This is exciting, Microsoft's social engagement. And many of our marketing departments will be really excited about this. This is a product that Microsoft uh, has now embedded into CRM, which allows you to go out and listen to the conversations on the Internet, you know, determine whether those are good or bad, or, or, or are they a sales opportunity, are they a support opportunity. We can listen to that conversation or look at what people are saying um, out on the Internet, drive that information back in the CRM, and make it, you know, reaction. So it could go to a customer service rep. That information could go to a sales rep. Um, so it allows us to go out and track and take things. Again, embedded in our CRM platform. This is a very exciting product called Insights for Dynamic CRM. And this is a data product within Microsoft CRM Online. It's included. 
if you use the on-premise product, there's, a, there's an extra fee for it. But this allows, and, and salespeople love this, this allows a salesperson to go in and put, I'm talking to ABC Manufacturing, who are the key contacts that I need to know? I can just put ABC Manufacturing in the, in the record and um, insights for dynamic CRM will complete the rest of the record for me, as well as allow me to add contacts. I can then look at those contacts and say, hey, I want to follow them on Twitter, do it right from the app. Hey, I want to link into them, I can do it right from the app. So from a productivity perspective, when I show this to salespeople, they get really excited about insights. Well, if insights are part of CRM, then we can get our salespeople excited about CRM as well. Power BI is a new um, uh, business intelligence tool um, written on the Excel platform that allows us to move the data in and out or, or read the data within dynamic CRM and report on it within Excel. Again, another very powerful tool. Um, most sales organizations I know, Excel is sort of the moment of truth. That's where we put everything in. So it, it's fun, it's a, it's a good product, and it's on the platform we, we need it to be. And again, if you're a, a company that does a lot of interfacing with a large customer base, another uh, part of the Microsoft product is the Parature, which is a, uh, a knowledge-based tool and customer service tool that links into Dynamic CRM. So if you have a large customer base, mostly in the B2C market, you know, have a look at Parature. But again, what I'm saying, this all sort of fits into this Dynamics ecosystem, dynamic CRM ecosystem that allow us to do a lot more, a lot quicker, and with a lot less money on this platform. And then we have what I call the ISV partners, all right? These are the people that build add-on products to dynamic CRM. And I think this is where we're gonna see some huge productivity gains within an organization. I'll just talk, you know, there's, there's probably a couple of hundred of these now, but here are some of the key ones that I've worked with. IPM Global, they do a construction project management application, sits on top of CRM. Genbill Software does an HR management application. CRM Gamified has one of the uh, most exciting products, I think. Um, they have a set of games that you can put on top of dynamic CRM that actually track, you know, how your salespeople are doing. So, for example, you know, they can get 10 points for putting a lead in the system. Um, they convert that lead to an opportunity, it can be another 10 points. They, uh, if that opportunity is worth more than $10,000, maybe they get 15 points. If they close that lead within 30 days, they get a bonus 25 points. And what it does is have a big game board in the sales office where they, they all compete against each other. So it's kind of exciting on the user adoption, but very exciting when we think about sales productivity. That's a small little component we can embed in CRM to make it much more powerful. Click Dimensions is the, the number one product out there for email marketing and internet marketing for dynamic CRM. D&B and InsideView have data management components. eSignLine has an e-signature application we can embed in CRM. ExpertLogic, ExpertDoc are really document management, uh, configuration pieces of software. Zap has a BI tool. And one of my favorites to work with is ADX Studio. They build a series of portals that allow you to uh, make your CRM instance customer facing for customer service for partner relationship management. So, you know, with the growth of the Microsoft um, ecosystem, we're seeing more and more companies start to move in and start to build these types of products. So I, I break CRM down into, you know, five basic categories. And today I'm going to be talking about Salesforce automation. That's my big orange category at the top. But we're also going to be talking about marketing automation and how that interfaces because really in today's sales world, the way people buy, the two are, are much in one. So I don't think you do CRM without marketing automation. And I think that's why we're seeing such a high growth in products like Click Dimensions. Um, again, customer service is a component of CRM. Um, XRM applications, uh, I don't, don't know if you're familiar with this, but because CRM is built on a .NET platform with SQL Server on the back end, it can be used as a development tool, a development application. So we're seeing, um, you know, people build inventory control, fleet control. Um, we're seeing other applications being built right on dynamic CRM. And this is like Genbill. If you look at their product, they built this HR management system on 
CRM. If you look at IPM Global, they build a construction project management application that sits on CRM. So they're using the power of CRM to drive these apps. That's what we call the XRM. So if you have a custom application in your business um, that interfaces with sort of, uh, you know, sales, customer service, field management, anything like that, again, we can bring that in uh, into CRM with the power of CRM and build it on the XRM platform. The last piece there is partner relationship management, and we're seeing this is a very high growth area, and that's where you may have people within your own ecosystem of your business where you want to interface. For example, if you have any sort of channel partners you resell through, if you have distributors resell through, if you have franchisees that you work with, um, or if you have suppliers, you can have them all interface into one system. And the beauty of this is, you know, I'm working in customer service, I have a problem with a product that, that came from one of my suppliers right through my CRM portal, I can publish that out to the supplier, they can come in with a response, I can publish that back out to my customer. That all can be done on the Microsoft CRM platform. So, I mean, it's a very, very powerful tool, and some of us aren't going to get there tomorrow building that out, but um, Microsoft's giving us a framework to be able to build those types of powerful systems, which is, which is a good thing because this is the product I work with, so it's, it's pretty well endless. So, you know, I talked about the CRMUG um, User Group Association. For, so if you're not a member, go and join today at CRMUG.com. Uh, it's one of the strongest organizations because it's made up mostly of uh, people who use dynamic CRM. And I do a lot of work with them at organizing chapters as well as um, work with them at their conferences doing different sessions on CRM. And one of the sessions I do is user adoption. Um, and I do it in t at, at two levels. We do an SMB user adoption session, usually at the conference, and we do a enterprise user adoption session. And the conversations are quite different between, you know, the problems of a small company and a large company, but there's a golden thread that runs through. It's user adoption and what you need to do to fix it. So here are some of the pointers that have come out of these discussions that I'd like to share with you. Project ownership needs to come from the line of business. And what I mean from that is, you're going to hear me keep repeating myself saying CRM is forever. It's something that we keep doing ongoing. It's not an IT project that has a start and finish. So let's say I was using Skype for business and I installed it, got everybody up and running on it, got them trained, that project's kind of done. CRM doesn't work that way. CRM has a lot of moving parts dealing with relationships, has a lot of data, has a lot of reporting, has marketing automation. It's a ongoing moving product project within an organization. So it really needs to be strategically owned by the line of business and administered by the line of business. Because when I say the line of business, I mean the marketing department, the sales department, the customer service department needs to own the driver um, in this uh, in this project. So that's kind of the number one thing that comes out over and over again. And it's kind of nice to see at the user group, you know, when I did these five years ago, we were 70% um, IT people in the audience and 30% business. Last time around, we were probably 60-40 in favor of business. So we're seeing that transformation of the ownership of these projects moving into the line of business. The number two thing is understand your business processes and what needs to be enhanced. I don't want to say fixed or re-engineered, what needs to be enhanced. And this is sort of the way I do projects, and I'll, and I'll show you some of that as we move through. Start small, but keep it growing. Like, don't try to build sort of the Death Star right out of the box, right? Go and say, okay, we know where we want to go. We know what processes we want to enhance. Um, what do we move? What do we do first to get some successes to keep the project moving? Spend time on design and proof of concepts. Um, most of the companies that hire me to come in and look at projects that, I don't want to call them failed, but have stalled, right? It's because they didn't spend time on design. They didn't spend time on proof of concepts. Many companies will try to get away with, you know, we'll just use CRM out of the box and see how it goes. Those projects, pretty much, it's 100% failure. If you don't customize it for your business somewhat, you know, even a small area of your business and you don't bring in the data you need, um, it can become problematic. Um, leverage ISV partners, have good data, good training, good coaching. Again, we're going to talk about great CRM leadership, CRM is forever, how do we evangelize around that? 
So there's a lot of things uh, around this project ownership that we can keep driving. Some of, the, some of the studies out there also sort of um, reinforce this, and this was done a few years ago, I believe it was by the Yankee Group, where we start to see, you know, people being surveyed on what they would do to enhance their CRM applications. The number one thing, promote user adoption. And I'm going to keep coming back to this throughout these next three sessions to talk about it more and more. We're going to talk more about better defining processes, just like this report says, get management buy-in, and again, data management. So there's a bunch of things that we can do and need to do around this to make it better. So here's sort of a, the step-by-step -step process we're going to go through over the next three sessions. Um, and it talks about, you know, setting your objectives, putting your CRM team together, budgeting, business review, process mapping, requirements, design, build, test, pilot, technical training, and mid training, user training, user adoption, admin support, and next steps. Now, when you look at this, you might say, hmm, this looks pretty complicated, but I'm going to break it down into kind of bite-sized chunks. So, you know, you can do this if you're five users in a small business or 5,000 users in an enterprise. You just need to scale it. It takes longer to do, and there may be some more moving parts. But I think um, these this approach step-by-step step really gives us some kind of framework and some sort of test areas to kind of move from one to the next. And uh, I've had some pretty good success with uh, working on projects within companies kind of using this methodology. So let's talk about setting objectives. You know, when I, when I work to set objects, objectives, we usually look to try to put a, you know, a discovery session in place. And that discovery session, um, I do it to educate the team. So I try to pull everybody into a room that's involved with this, usually from a management perspective and maybe some key users to kind of get their buy-in so they understand what CRM is and what it can do for them. And, and I'm going to drill back into this as we go, but it's really I need to educate these team members about CRM. So, yeah, I still walk into many organizations and they ask me, what do you do? I'm a CRM guy, and they go, what does CRM stand for? So, you know, it's mainstream in a lot of industries, but in a lot of other industries it's still not. Um, again, by putting a discovery session together. We want to build organizational support, buy-in. Uh, we want to show them how we're going to bring a systematic approach, a big picture approach, and how we're going to do this. What's our project scope and deliverables? And we want to deliver momentum, buy-in, and, and create champions. So it's an early on, this is all at a high level, but what I'm really trying to say is engage early. Engage the business users early in the process so they know what's coming and you know who's going to get behind it and we know who's going to be your champions. So here's a, here's a session outline. Again, I talk about the three pillars of success, understanding applications, the real ROI on CRM, and the overview of the steps to CRM. If somebody's doing a discovery session and you want some help, I've got lots of slide decks and, and things that I can help you with please reach out to me and uh, I'll have my contact information at the end of this presentation and I can sort of help you framework your discovery session. So that's my give to you uh, before attending this session. Okay, so who do we want to influence? And this is kind of interesting, right? Um, we need to understand the needs of the CRM stakeholders, but we also need to influence them, get the champions, and get them to come back and tell us, you know, what's in it for them. Because especially, you know, everybody's got lots of work, lots of projects going on. How do we engage people? How do we get them sort of involved in our project? So when I'm working with an organization, these are the people we typically try to reach out to. First of all, C-level executives, CEO, CIO, CMO, lots of benefits for them. Sales teams, sales organizations, marketing teams, customer service teams, field service management teams, IT support and development. And in your organization, there may be other areas where you're trying to embed CRM, but we want to bring people in as a group because really it's, it's the relationship um, management of all, you know, sort of interactions from supply chain to customers to prospects to partners that we want to pull into this application and work with it. So there's many people, you know, in our organization that we have to kind of work with on that. So when I'm talking to C-level executives about CRM, there's certain areas I want to get into. Now, um, I've done a lot of work with uh, partners who are trying to sell CRM to people. And, you know, we'll go in on a sales call and there'll be C-level executives there. And, you know, they're showing how to take a lead and convert to a contact, make an account, that type of thing. And that's all great. 
But at the end of the day, C-level executives aren't really interested in that. They're not interested in the functionality of your application. They're interested in the business reason for doing this, right? So I talk to them about CRM helping with the growth, and growth and profitability of the company. Really, what can we do to improve sales, to improve marketing effectiveness, to improve customer retention? What can we do with CRM? What are the outcomes of CRM if we do it right? That's what they want to talk about. They're concerned about changing business models, social mobility and technology. They see all this coming around them. They see, you know, companies like Uber coming into a space like the taxi service and changing the game, right? You know, we don't have travel agencies anymore. We have, you know, travelocity. So this is what they're saying, what's coming up for me? What's the game changer? Okay, well, we can help you with interacting with all the social, interacting with mobility, but you need a CRM as the foundation or the backbone. Security, how, how secure is my data? If it's floating around on a bunch of spreadsheets, it's absolutely not secure. In CRM, we have a different level of security um, that we can use, that we can monitor and manage. Business insights, what can I see about my business? Many organizations today still, you know, C-level people see only reports about what happened the last 90 days, six months, or year. They don't see what's coming down the pipe. And when I get into a project where a new C-level executive comes in and says, the reporting's not good enough, I want to know what's, you know, what's happening now. I want to know what's happening in 30 days, 90 days. I want to know what's happening in six months. Those are the ones that drive the CRM projects and we'll get the budgets for you. Here's one people forget about, competitive threats, okay? Um, sales managers worry about competitive threats more than anybody else, but so is the C-level executive. Which competitor is beating me? Where are they beating me? When are they beating me? Can I build a CRM system to monitor the competition? That alone will pay for most projects. There's enough ROI there to easily pay for that project in many organizations. Talk about that. Talk about operational efficiencies. How are things being done today? You know, you're going through and doing an analysis of, you know, how people are working today. You'd be, you know, you'd see a lot of duplication of information, especially if they're filling out different forms, different systems that could all be brought into CRM, save you time, save you money. Can CRM help your company valuation? Absolutely. The data in your CRM software is worth millions of dollars for most organizations. And most of that data today is on spreadsheets that are dispersed that they can't get to, or their sales reps own it, and they're walking around with it, and when that sales rep leaves, goes to a different organization, they take that asset with them. At least with CRM, we're going to have a copy of that asset to start with. So company valuation uh, is very a key component of CRM. ROI on investments. You know, Sometimes when we walk into an organization, we have to guess what the ROI of CRM is. But as I start working with an organization, I'm always looking for ROI points. Wow, if we change that, what's the ROI? How are we going to, chart, how are we going to change marketing costs, marketing effect? You know, um, how are we going to change the way they sell to be more efficient with SMB, with mid-market, with enterprise, with channel? I mean, we're always looking at different ways. And again, if we go back to that nucleus um, study that says $5.60, for every dollar we spend. Yes, it's there if we do it right. And again, all this information and what they're doing, the C-level executive needs to satisfy a board of directors. If they have this CRM initiative that's feeding them a lot more, more and better information, then we're better off, right? They're better off. They look better to their boss. So again, there's lots in it for people and what they're doing. Well, you know, marketing, most CRM projects that I get involved with are kind of driven out of the marketing department uh, these days because of, the, because of that number one reason, the impact of social media. You know, all these people are coming to us, hitting on us, talking about us, talking to us, want to interact with us on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. How do we handle that? Personalized communications, right? It's, it's moved to a one-on-one -on -one discussion, right? It's not a group email mass marketing anymore, which still happens but we want to take it out of that and move it into a one-on-one. -on -one. Marketing campaigns, customer loyalty, segmenting, brand presence, budgeting, hiring and training and managing people, reporting, satisfying the C-level executive. Uh, it's all affected by CRM. So when I'm talking to the marketing team, this is what's in it for them. 
this is the discussion area. So whether I'm an outside consultant coming in to help you, I want to talk about this. Whether I'm a partner wanting, you know, probably to sell you some software, uh, you got to talk about this. But even those on the call today that are internal to a company, sit down with your marketing team and say, what do we can do? What can we do better with CRM? What can we plan? You know, what can we do with our costs? What can we do to be more effective with CRM? And what's the plan to do this? And really, that's where the needs of the project are going to come out. Customer service. You know, these probably are some of the most sophisticated CRM users because for some reason, organizations thought a long time ago is we've got to track customer problems. We don't have to track customer sales so much, but the problems. Uh, and I don't quite understand why there's a difference, but uh, they've got this sorted out in most organizations. Well, they're under a new threat today because of social media. People are not just waiting in their queue on the 1-800 line. People are complaining out on Twitter, right? So they need to deal with things quicker and faster. So again, the CRM project really embeds itself within this group. And really, how to, you know, customer retention and loyalty, 24-hour self-service and portals. Uh, you know, we're seeing things like ADX Studio and Parature, you know, skyrocketing these days just because we've got to be accessible 724. They got to deal with mobility, their clients being on mobility, or them using mobile devices when they're not at their desk. Revenue generation, social media interactions, I talked about that. Having a platform to hire and train and manage people. You know, if you don't have the best technology today, you're not going to hire the best young people. They're just used to this, you know, bring your own device or using something that's an S, you know, software as a service on the internet that works really well. If we ask them to work with spreadsheets and email systems and, you know, fill out a form type thing, uh, it's not going to work. They're not going to stick around. We're not going to have the best people. And again, they, um, our customer service people need to generate revenues now. We're putting pressures on them to, you know, sell support packages, sell maintenance packages, sell upgrades to products. So it's, it's, it's a whole interesting dynamic and that's going on um, within customer service again. The ROI is very strong for CRM. Field service. There was an announcement uh, in the last week that Microsoft just bought a product called Field One. I'm going to have to add that logo to my ISV, um, or actually to my Microsoft stack now. They're the number one um, provider of field service management applications. So IPM Global is the field service project management. Um, field One manages your dispatching. And, and, and uh, calendaring of all your, your field resources within Dynamics CRM. So these people are really being pulled in. And for the first time, you know, our fellow here with the hard hat who's running a construction site has got a tablet and he's being asked to fill in information real time. So again, field service, mobility, dispatching, revenues, customer satisfaction. You know, go back to that revenue. You know, I'm working with landscape management teams now being asked to use tablets because they're out there doing the flowers, you know, doing the trees, cutting, cutting the grass, plowing the snow, and the customers are coming up to the crew and saying, by the way, I want those four trees back there removed. Can you give me a quote? Now, that used to be a, a long process if the team lead remembered to do it at all, or they filled out a paper form to do it. Now, it's all done on the tablet, right? So I can go into a tablet, these four trees, here's the quote. Can you approve this quote? Yes, okay, with purchase orders right there. So we can do a lot more quicker, better, and understand what's going on all the time. Again, these people are looking at portal services, response time, hiring and training, and, you know, the core metrics of reporting. People we need to know costly, you know, labor's costly, what's my labor doing out there? So if you have these people within your organization, bring them in the CRM, bring them into the conversation. IT, I'll kind of leave this one alone because it's really, you know, cloud versus on-premise, convergence of technology. This is stuff they understand, you know, we understand. And most things written about CRM today uh, from a deployment is really written around, you know, working with the IT and getting it done. Let's stay on the business side, but it's still important. And most of the time you're going to get buy-in from your, your IT department that this is something need to be done, needs to be done because they're probably supporting multiple systems. You know, I always say in an organization who doesn't have CRM or who's not using it correctly is, oh, you've got all kinds of CRM in your business. Your salespeople have built their own CRM in Excel spreadsheets or Outlook. Your marketing people have built their own CRM on some standalone marketing automation system. 
same with customer service or field service. We all have something we've built to do our business and do our work, and the IT department now has to run around, support all these other platforms, or they could just support CRM for all these sort of business needs. Here's my favorite one. Here's the one where I spend my days and nights thinking about CRM and how we improve things. And from an ROI perspective, this is where we can really crank it up. What are the sales team challenges? Or if I'm talking to the sales manager, what are the challenges and what do we do with CRM? Well, generating revenues and profits. It's the number one thing that this person thinks about all day. We can do lots for them on CRM to do that. Changing buying process. I'm going to talk a little bit about this next is really over the last 10 years, the buying process of most companies has changed. It's gone social. It's on the website. You know, there's studies, you know, Challenger Sales says that, which is a study done on the sales process, says that most B2B companies are 57% of their way through their buying process before they talk to a sales team. I've talked to senior software people in the um, enterprise space, and they feel it's up to around 70 or 80% of the buying process and gathering their information before they reach out to our sales force. So what's going on in your business? How's the buying process changed because of the Internet? Okay, sales process improvement. If the buying process has changed, I've got to change my sales process. I've got to redeploy and restructure my sales team to be able to deal with this. And, you know, I'm working on a couple of enterprise accounts right now, big successful companies um, who are saying, you know what, we've got to change this. We've got to change it quick because the way our customer is buying is changing as we sit here today. They think about new business development. How am I going to capture new accounts? And they think about retention. How am I going to retain my old accounts? Which leads to account and territory management. How do I deploy my people properly so I have the right coverage in my current, in current accounts, in my target prospects, or if we have channel partners that we have to develop, how do we build that uh, time and territory um, map out? Again, if you don't use CRM, it's nearly impossible to do. Channel management. How do I manage my channel? What do I have out in my channel? Am my channel winning or losing? Who are they competing against? If I've got 20, 30, 40% of my product being sold through a channel, I better know this. Well, you know, working with a PRM company like ADX Studio, we can publish that information or gather that information from the web, bring it back in, feed it to this person. Hiring and training and managing people is very difficult for sales organizations, especially if we don't have CRM because we don't have a process, you know, that they can really follow. Sales reps kind of develop their own process, but the big part is the sales data. Where was the last rep prospecting? Who were they talking to? What's not on that Excel spreadsheet that they left behind that we need to know? If we have a CRM system, we can capture that. And you've got to remember, if a sales rep leaves your organization and they're not using CRM, they're taking that data with them. So our new rep starts, they start from zero, or our old rep is working for a competitor down the street, closing deals they should have been closing for us. Again, hiring and training, managing competitive threats. This is big time, right? If I'm a sales manager, I need to know who I'm competing against on every deal because we position our products and services differently against different competitors. As well, if I'm losing in one area to a competitor and not losing in another area, hmm, I got to know something. Maybe there's different pricing. Maybe my salesperson's weak in that area, or maybe they got a really good salesperson in that area. How do I react? What do I do? If I don't have this information, I can't react, I can't do it. In CRM, if we have it, if we're a CRM culture and use it, we have that information. Again, compensation management. Go to your sales team and see how much time they spent on commissions. It's a lot of time. So you can either custom build something um, that's standalone or integrate this into CRM and customize CRM um, for your uh, compensation management as well as there are several add-on products for compensation management out there that we can just bolt on to Dynamic CRM and hook them back to the ERP system. So when a deal closes, goes into ERP, gets confirmed, and up comes what that commission should be paid out. So there's a lot of things we can do to streamline what we do, how we do it, and how effective. Again, it all you know, means what can we, how can we help the sales manager be more productive? 
So I'm going to stick to this line right now that talks about the ROI on customer relationship management from a sales perspective. We all want to follow a simple sales process that takes a lead to a prospect to a customer. We want to be able to move that through. Well, if we use CRM properly, we can do this. If we don't have CRM or don't use it properly, this is what happens, this is what it looks like, and it kills our productivity. We don't know which leads are best. We don't know how long they've been. We don't know which leads we've lost. We don't know what prospects are in the system. We don't know who we talked to last year that could be ripe to sell to this year. And customers don't get upsold. They don't get cross-sold. They don't get serviced properly because we don't have the data. You've got to remember, if I'm a sales rep and I'm in a territory, I'm kind of really focusing on what I'm closing in my pipeline and what's going to close in the next 30, 60, 90 days. Other stuff comes after that because that's what I'm comped on. So we need control mechanisms, we need you know, marketing automation support to be able to pull it back together to look like this. So some of, you know, simple three boxes, this to this, is, is crucial, okay? So when I work with a sales, uh, on a Salesforce automation project, I say to people, I don't wanna change everything. I wanna fine tune things. I wanna enhance things. So let's think about it this way. If your sales, your closing rate on new leads is 20%, if we can fine tune the process, we can get marketing automation working right, if we can get sort of education, if we can get content management working, if we can get a better qualification process, if we can monitor what's going on and monitor the pipeline, make sure things don't fall through the cracks, and we just fine tune that lead process from 20 to 30%, that increases sales 50% on those leads. So little things you can do in a sales process has huge, huge payback. If I can close one more deal per quarter, and, you know, and I'm selling $5 million deals, that's a lot of money. That pays for the CRM. So small improvements in sales can lead to great results. When I'm working on Salesforce automation, I work with the sales management team saying, okay, what's going on today? What do we need to do to improve the productivity? What information do you need? What processes do we have to fix? And you know what? that person sitting across that desk from you, senior salesperson, is gonna be your biggest champion. And guess what? There won't be a rep on earth that's gonna tell that sales manager that I don't have time to put the data in the system because that's a complete cop-out. Because if I follow that sales rep around, they're putting that data in many systems today. They're putting that data in their own system. They may not wanna share it, but they are absolutely putting this data somewhere. We just gotta corral it and bring it in and work it into our process. So let's stay on this whole idea of ROI and sales team. So here's a study that was done by Pace Productivity where they give electronic devices to people and they plug in these devices and, and monitor what they do on a daily basis. They did a group of financial planning salespeople and, he, and they shared this with me. So they said this group of sales reps spent 23% of their time selling and I'll just say 77% of their time doing everything else. Well, if we look at this and say, hmm, 23% of their time selling, first thing I thought of, well, I get comp on selling. I don't get comp on anything else in any of the other boxes or, or pies, right, slices. Um, but what do I want to be doing? I want to be selling, right? I want to improve that selling time. And really, if you look at 23% of your selling time, that means you sell all day Monday until 11 o'clock on Tuesday, and then you shut her down for the week to do admin work, right? Hmm, that's not right. So when I looked a little further at this pie chart, I said, what else does it tell me? Well, if I've got a million dollar quota, and that's what I got written down here, then each 1% of my time is worth $43,478.26. Wow, that selling time is really, really valuable to me and my organization. So what if, right? What if, theoretically, I could increase that selling time? If I could increase that selling time by cutting back on admin, cutting back on order processing, cutting back on travel, cutting back on service, you know, could I increase that, you know, just a little bit, maybe from 23% to 30%? That means I sell all day on Tuesday, right? That means I move my sales up from 1 million a year to 1.3 million. That's huge. That is very, very significant, especially if I've got 10 salespeople, 100 salespeople, 1,000 salespeople. What if, what if we dreamed and we said we could move it to 40%? Hmm, they're up to 1.7 million. That's massive, right? I've almost really doubled their sales by just making them more productive and giving them more selling time. Now think, 
if we can go in and we can fine tune that lead management process, if we do better competitive analysis so we know how to position and, and move our products for, forward or, or projects forward and close more business, I can probably make that selling time more productive too. So maybe I could double the, the output of my salespeople. So this is the picture you have to paint when you're looking at a CRM project because the CRM project would then move away from a cost center for your organization to uh, an investment. We're investing in CRM in order to do this. It's not costing us 200K. We're investing 200K because we want to get $2 million back in sales. And if I can do this, it's every year, right? It's not like I'm going to make this bump in sales once and not get it again. I'm going to continue on that path. So when we're talking about Salesforce automation, really, this is where we got to go. This is the conversation we have to have. Um, a couple other things that I, I always bring out is this is an old study done by Bell Phone Power, but it's really relevant. Why customers leave? Well, 1% die, 3% move away, 9% left you because of pricing. 14 had another reason. Other felt uh, 14 were not happy. Five had another reason they didn't disclose. In this study, it said 68% of people left because of neglect. That means we sold them something and we got out of Dodge. We never, never heard back from them. And this happens in so many companies. And when I start to look at, uh, you know, how they sell, what they sell, what information they keep, I'll tell you what happens. When I go into most organizations, the best data I can find is the accounting system, right? You know, here's the company and here's the two people that are in the accounting system we deal with. You know, one we deal with for uh, product uh, problems and the other one we deal with for payment, right? <laughs> So we got two people. Well, that's not who we sell to. We may sell to the office management. We may sell to the senior people. We may sell to the head of maintenance. There could be a whole bunch of other people we need to influence and sell. Well, if they're not in the database, who's calling them? Maybe the rep who sold them that product or service is gone. They're not with the organization anymore. So therefore, we don't know this person exists. So when we send out a product update, we invite somebody out to the golf tournament, when we send out a Christmas card or holiday card of some sort, Nobody's getting it, or it's going to the accounting department, right? You know, a fruit basket going to the accounting department at Christmas just doesn't work because they don't like you anyhow because they're paying money to you. So they're just saying, hey, what's this fruit basket costing me? This is what happens. And finally, when it comes, they're sitting around a table to renew a contract or to buy something else, I say, hmm, that ABC company, I've never heard from them after they sold to me. And you may be, you know, doing stellar service for them, and you may be, you know, doing some great things, but they don't know what you're doing. You're not touching those people. So I think neglect starts to happen just because we don't have them captured and we don't plan our communications. So I threw some numbers together. What's the value of a customer? So in this little study I've done, you can you know place your customer numbers in it. So if a new customer buys from your business for five years, an average customer generates 25 orders at an average size of $500, and the lifetime income for that new customer would be uh, 5 times 25 times 500, $62,500, okay? That sounds all right. That sounds average. Maybe it's bigger for some companies, smaller for others. So if we have a 30% gross margin, that means the value of that customer is $18,750. If I have 1,000 customers, that's worth $18 million. I have 10,000 customers, it's worth $187 million. Now, what's the CRM database worth to manage those customers? Uh, do I have a sales rep going to tell me they haven't got time to put that customer information in the CRM? Because that customer is worth $18,750. So there's a lot of things we can start to build when we start to look at the value of CRM. So in this planning, what I'm trying to get you to is to say, you know what, what are we doing? How are we doing? What's the value? What's the ROI? Just so your company becomes the you know, a company that supports the culture of CRM sees this as a long-term project with, you know, some very significant goals in mind, where we want to go, what we want to do, and where we want to bring things. So I'm going to leave this off today at this point, right? Um, I'm Rick M. Full Contact Selling. Any comments, any question, you want any one of these slides, please get a hold of me. Um, there's my number as well. And we can, you know, further communicate on how we can improve the productivity, how we can, how you can get CRM bought in your organization, and what needs to be done. So I'm going to, you know, leave you on this: the ownership of well-managed customer and prospect data is a priceless asset to your organization. 
those gold bricks. To me, the good, well-maintained data in a CRM system is that gold to your organization. You know, if it's not in the CRM, you don't own the gold. So if we start thinking about it and we can get our organizations to think this way, good, good things are going to happen. So Jason, can we open it up to see if we have any questions coming in? And uh, I'll stay online for a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Rick. We absolutely can uh, take questions now if you want to use the Q&A block that you should see to the right of the slides. Just enter in your questions and uh, we will uh, pose them to Rick. Uh, Rick, one, one question, uh, you know, one of the things that's uh, developing right now is, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, incentivizing sales folks to, to enter their data into CRM with uh, more task-specific or more well-tailored uh, applications. Are, are you seeing that in the, uh, in the clients that you're working with, uh, examining the idea of not just uh, customizing CRM, but also looking at more uh, and more applicable interfaces? Yeah, so I think that's what we're seeing a lot with the tablets, especially, um, you know, where I'm going out making calls, um, you know, very simple CRM interface to be able to add data. Um, I think the inside view, which embedded into the Dynamics CRM Online product is, is really moving in that direction too. So I can just look up a customer's name and pull the data in, look up the contact name, pull the data in. And then another thing that you can do in that app is track that person, track that company, and again, feed you the data, the data that you need. So absolutely, we're seeing more emphasis on the data. On the compensation side, yes. Um, I've seen many companies start to put the use of your CRM as part of your um, uh, objective for the year. So, you know, it could be up to 5% of your bonus could be based on how well you maintain your CRM. And I find these are these are the sort of the best ways of uh, getting things done is you know what's in it for them. It's part of my compensation plan. Right. And and you know and I'll talk about some more stuff as we go. But you know I've done some stuff around. Well, if you if you don't put the contact in in the account, then you can't create an opportunity. Well, if you can't create an opportunity, you can't send a quote request to the pricing department. So it just you know you can. You can ask people to put it in politely and train them, but at the end of the day, you, you know, I think it's got to be a requirement just because I think that data is gold and many organizations do as well. Absolutely. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in here, and uh, one of them, which I was just about to mention, when is part two of this series? Uh, part two is next Thursday. I'm actually going to put a link in here so you can, uh, in the chat area, if, oops, I sent that to the wrong. And not send that to everybody. Let me try that again. It's uh, next Thursday, same time. You can uh, these, register these recorded, from the right, Jason? And they And they are being recorded as well. Uh, another question that came in, um, other, well, you touched on this, but um, are there other social CRM tools that you are excited about, interested in paying attention to right now? Well, you know, I think I'm, I do most of my work in, in B2B. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in B2C that I watch other people use. Uh, I think we're seeing more, you know, one of the things I'm seeing is more Facebook being pulled over to the business side, which I don't know if I'm happy with or not, because that's sort of where I used to keep all my cousins and family information on. But uh, a lot of businesses are starting to reach out to me, and strategic companies are, release, are reaching out to me on Facebook. So we're seeing that so kind of pulled into the conversation. Um, Twitter is very powerful. Um, when I start to look at you know, pulling Twitter followers into CRM and managing and monitoring that, um, it's becoming more significant. So as this social crowd that sort of establishes over the 10 years starts moving up within business organizations, we're going to see, I think, over the next 10 years, even a more um, integrated approach to what we do socially and what we do within CRM. Another person asks, do you see more success with using add-on products or developing a custom solution? Um, well, I think the ISV add-on product speeds things up. Um, and I, in, the old, in the long run, I think it's less expensive to build out. So I look at, you know, I did some work with IPM on the construction side, and I saw a, um, a company quoting to build something direct, and then I said, well, you should use IPM Global for the same, pro you know, same project, 
it's going to give you 80% of what you need, and I estimated it would probably come in at about half the cost. So typically, um, if an ISV product can bring you a significant way there, it's kind of tested. You're going to have other customers using it. They're going to support it. It's probably going to run on a mobile platform a lot easier. It's been tested. Usually the total cost of ownership, if you can use one of these ISV products or add-on products, is lower. And I think you'll be happier because, you know, we've all got the pro – and I don't know how many programmers are on the call today, but we've always got the promises of the programmers. When are they going to be done, right? And uh, sometimes that tends to stretch out to – anywhere from two times as long as they told you to ten times. So uh, if an ISV product can get us there quicker, absolutely go with the ISV product. In saying that, check the ISV product out, right? So check out that, you know, they've done this, how many customers, talk to – if they have some customers in a non-competitive space to you, talk to them, you know, and find out what they think of the product. Okay, well, uh, that was the last question in our queue. I'll make a final call for questions here as we start to wrap up. I do want to remind folks there is a survey that'll pop, that should pop up as you as you depart today. We really do appreciate that feedback, uh, both for our own planning and also our speakers like to like to get that from uh, from the audience. Thanks for all the questions today. Um, we do have that session next Thursday. It is planning and designing your CRM project. Uh, Rick, anything else you want to add uh, to preview that event? So next week, um, we're going to start digging into the process and how to map a CRM pro – well, we'll do some more around the planning and getting started, but then I'm going to take a CRM process and say, um, how do we map that process? What do we look for when we map that process? And then how do we take that process to requirements, and then how do we get someone to build it, and what we need to do to really get it deployed properly. The last session is really going to be around all about user adoption, how to build that user adoption program within your organization. So I think we've got some pretty, two pretty solid sessions coming up. Absolutely. We're, we're definitely looking forward to those. But with that, uh, we will conclude today's event. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks to everyone on the call. We hope to see you as well next week. That concludes the event. Have a great day.